What is up, guys? Welcome back to Fit Body Secrets, where my mission is to bring you guys inspiration, motivation, and a ton of tips to help you guys on your fitness journey. Uh, last week, I talked a little bit about creating, well, a lot about creating a calorie deficit. Um, and I thought that it kind of would segue well to talk a little bit about macronutrients today and how they fit into a nutrition plan and more so give you guys an understanding of if and when you should implement looking to count or track or budget your macronutrients. And I feel like a lot of people have a misconception as to what macro tracking really entails and some people tend to use it and then get burned, down by, bleh, burned out by it. And I want to just kind of take an episode to overall give you guys a little bit of a better understanding of things, maybe even just touch on some basics and then get you guys a strategy to hopefully using them if you so choose to. So say a quick hello to people. Hey, Ken and hey, Judy, um, Judy, Jody. I forget there's a Judy and there's a Jody. I have to always remember which one I'm talking to. Uh, and hopefully, Jody, hopefully you'll get some, some tips out of this one as well. Hey, Miss Holly. Okay, so today we're going to talk about macros. Macronutri macros is short for macronutrients. I'm going to pull up my notes right here. Uh, first and foremost, what I want you guys to understand is that macros are a part of your diet, whether you choose to count them or not. So our calories essentially are going to come from our macronutrients. Every gram of protein has four calories. So if I eat 100 grams of protein, that's going to be 400 calories of my diet. If I have uh, 125 grams of protein, that's going to be 500 calories of my diet. So that's where our calories come from. Carbohydrates also have four calories per gram. So once again, if I have 200 carbohydrates that day, I've eaten 800 calories from carbohydrates. Fats make up nine calories per gram. So if I've had 100 grams of fat, that means I've had 900 calories from fat. And a really interesting thing here that I like to mention is that for a lot of my clients that come from a quote unquote low carb or a keto background, wonder why things stall out. Often it's because they're not recognizing the calorie components of macronutrients and that fats are over two times as caloric as carbohydrates. So when it comes to seeing weight loss, it's a lot easier for the, the uh, calories to add up if I'm eating a higher fat diet versus a higher carb diet. So you know, if I have 100 carbs, that's only 400 calories. If I have 100 grams of fat, that's 900 calories. Just a little bit of a tangent to talk to you guys about that for those of you guys there that are demonizing carbohydrates because you think that they make you fat. Carbohydrates don't make you fat. Now, when it comes to counting macronutrients, I want you guys to understand a couple of the things that it can help you aside from just fat loss. Because fat loss, honestly, we can achieve weight loss by just keeping our calories in check and making sure that we're getting enough protein. In fact, you can lose weight without even tracking your protein by just keeping your calories in check. But when we actually dial in the macronutrients in a fat loss phase, we can optimize a couple of things like our energy, our satiation factor, um, even building meals that are, are feel good and allow us to feel satisfied after we eat them. But some of the other goals that people don't recognize that, you know, taking some time to actually dial in macronutrients is it really does help you build uh, nutritional awareness about what your body likes and what your body needs. So when you are, um, so a lot of people struggle with things like sugar, like I'm, I'm always craving sugar. I'm always craving X, Y, Z. And if you look at their diet and they typically are very low on fiber, low on protein, um, just by a session, which fiber isn't an, a macronutrient. Um, but another nutrient that I track. So, but we, we look at dialing in, okay, let's get you eating enough carbohydrates, some complex carbohydrates, get you eating enough protein. Oftentimes these sugar cravings go away. Um, you know, that's where people don't understand that it's not just about the fat loss component of things. The macronutrients do really help you uh, figure that stuff out. Second thing is, is when it comes to body recomposition or body composition in general, most people, when they're looking to lose weight, they don't want to lose lean muscle mass. They want to lose fat. And we actually want to preserve and build lean muscle tissue. So when we are ensuring that we have the right macronutrients, primarily protein and enough carbohydrates to fuel our muscle building, so our, our training, we can actually make sure that we are getting in the right nutrients to ensure that we are losing prior, prior, primarily fat and not taking away from our muscle. So that's the other real benefit of that. Um, 
macronutrients, guys, even from a perspective of not looking to lose fat, for those of you guys out there that might be performance-based and maybe not looking to compete, but like you do enjoy feeling good in the gym. Nobody wants to go to the gym and try and like PR their back squat only to be stuck at the same weight every single week, every single cycle, and never really making any progress. Simply by dialing in the right amount of food and the right amount of macros, you can actually learn to optimize your energy and your workout fueling and get better results. And then I think another big one is it really does help you guys troubleshoot nutritional deficiencies that you might be dealing with. And that's going to obviously help you guys feel better. So hormones, metabolism, um, gut health, all those things can be fixed just by taking some time to dial in your macronutrients. I think the other real cool about dialing in your cool thing about dialing in your macronutrients is that when you are focusing on that as a you're focusing on your macronutrients, it often fixes other areas of your nutrition that you might be lacking in, like meal structure. If you lack any kind of meal structure, by dialing in your macronutrients, you have to be more aware of what's going into each meal. So it does help you be a better planner. It gets you to help with some of your other habits. Um, it helps you choose higher quality foods because when you are looking to dial in your macronutrients and you're eating a lot of like hyper palatable or high calorie combination foods, it becomes very hard to stay within your macro ranges. So you do have to make those changes to simpler, more whole foods in order to make it more effective for yourself. And, and some people, this is where they get stressed out and they're like, oh my God, macro tracking is too stressful for me. I can't figure it out. Well, it's also likely because you're not making those changes to your diet that actually are necessary, whether you track macros or not. And that's where it can kind of a roundabout way actually help you guys fix those habits. So if you're somebody out there that does struggle with that, like I'm always over my fat, I'm always under my protein. That's likely why you're likely choosing the wrong foods. And by having the right types of foods, it does help you fix food quality, but also dialing in the macros is going to give you the right amount of those things. So a couple of things that I think people need to understand when it comes to counting macros is I used to say, and still come, do believe that macros is not a diet. It's not a diet to look at macros. It's kind of like budgeting uh, your money, right? It's budgeting your money, just like really calories is budgeting your money. And macros is like budgeting maybe how you're spending your money and in, in like maybe some, some of your finances going to your house, some of them going to, you know, like you know, maybe self-care stuff. But with, with macronutrients, it's not really a diet. However, it can become a fat loss strategy if we are counting them and working to stay within a range to create fat loss. So just like calorie counting, is a strategy for weight loss. Macro counting is a strategy for weight loss as well. Um, and there are some prerequisites I feel like people need to kind of get comfortable with. And you can do it in the same way, like you can, or at the same time, you can count your macros and do these things. But these things really should be in place before you start getting hyper focused on numbers. Number one, you should be comfortable keeping a detailed food diary. So um, that means just taking time to go into my fitness pal, plugging in what you're eating or whatever app you use. I use my fitness pal using a food scale um, and, and really understanding the importance of portions and being accurate with what you're tracking. One of the biggest mistakes people are the, the biggest flaws with calorie counting and macro counting is people don't people tend to under report what they're consuming. Um, so if you're not reporting everything, you're missing the piece of the puzzle that's causing you to stall. So before you get into even looking at macronutrients, you got to make sure that you've got that under control. You can keep a food, a detailed food diary. And I always like to go back to when I first started my nutrition journey, there wasn't apps and computer programs. There was literally a notebook and a nutrition book. There wasn't even a website really. And I would literally look up the, you know, the pro or the calories in chicken breast or whatever. I wasn't even counting macros at that point. I just knew that I had to have protein at every meal. So it's, it's just so crazy how much more convenient things have become and how people still find them to be a hassle. <laughs> so it's really not that difficult to keep a food diary. In fact, even if you don't count macronutrients, I do think it's a very good habit to get into because that does allow you guys to see how the food you're eating is affecting your body. Okay. Number two is you need to be comfortable with looking at food labels and researching nutrition facts. I think a lot of people avoid this part of things, but it's probably one of the most beneficial part of things. As I go back to the beginning of my fitness journey, uh, that's exactly what I started to do. I started to pay attention to nutrition labels. I started to look up nutrition facts of common foods. You guys need to start to become like more educated on the food that's going into your body. And macronutrient counting does actually help you with this because you are going to start looking at nutrition labels. 
when you're looking at nutrition labels, um, some things you want to look at and some things you don't have to really worry about. Okay. Um, I always have my clients look at the protein, carbs, and fats, obviously. So is this primarily a protein heavy meat, a food, a carb heavy food, or a fat heavy food. So I know how it's going to fit into my diet. So let's just say it has 10 grams of fat and my total amount of fat for the day is 60 grams. And I'm like, okay, this is a, a good portion of fat for my diet. This is almost a, this is a serving of fat at a meal. If I'm going to break up in, into six meals, right? Um, if I see it also has a lot of carbs in it as well, I have to be aware of that. It's obviously going to be higher in calories. If I have fat and carbs together, that means it's going to be a higher calorie meal than just a fat. Um, so you want to look at the proteins, the carbs, the fats. You also want to take a look at the fiber count primarily in your carb heavy um, snacks and meals. Uh, because you want to make sure that you're getting in a good amount of car uh, fiber. So I think that the rule of thumb for me is like every 10 grams of carbs should have at least one gram of fiber. Like that's kind of a good rule of thumb. If it has more than that, even better. So like raspberries are super high in fiber. Um, that's really the goal with that. And then um, researching nutrition facts, uh, not just on the foods that you're eating at home, but also the food that you're eating when you're going out to restaurants. And sorry if you guys are listening on uh, Transistor. You know I love my or Transistor on podcast. Uh, I love my coffee, and it's midday, and I want to be able to get a workout in after this. So I got my coffee in hand, my pre-workout. But yes, you want to be looking at nutrition facts of other foods as well. So like not just what you're cooking at home. Like okay, what is the nutrition facts of a typical size of like New York style pizza? Um, how can I incorporate that into my diet on a Saturday if I want to have a slice, you know, or things like sushi and even things that like, maybe you're not you, just, just looking at nutrition facts of, of everything foods that you like, maybe it's chocolate. Like you want to start looking up different things and seeing what, where they fit into your macronutrient balance. And then the last thing I think is a prerequisite is just having some form of meal structure. Regardless of your goals, whether you're looking to lose weight, maintain weight, or build muscle, you guys should all have some type of a, of a meal frequency, a meal structure. Um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, two snacks. Maybe it's a light breakfast, a little bit bigger snack, and then a lunch. Like Whatever it is that works for you, you want to have some kind of a cadence to your meals and knowing what those meals should look like. There should always be a protein. And before we even get into counting macronutrients, I think that going into this meal structure and the prerequisite is just looking at what it looks like to have a balanced meal of macronutrients, right? So what does a balanced meal really look like? There should be a serving of protein on your plate. There should be a serving of carbohydrates on your plate. There should be some vegetables, at least at two of your meals. I don't like to push them at every meal, but at least two of your meals should have vegetables. And there should be a little bit of fat somewhere. So sometimes your, your animal protein is going to be a little bit higher fat. You don't have to add any fat. Maybe it's a lower uh, fat protein. So you want to add a little bit of fat, but your meals should be pretty balanced. And, and that's really a good way for you guys to segue into macro counting, because if you've already got the balance in your meals, now we're just making small tweaks to things. I think that people try and do this the wrong way. And you look at their food diary and their breakfast is like toast and peanut butter and coffee. I'm like, okay, there's no protein. So like we can just add some protein in there, but if you started with this first, it makes it a lot easier. Okay. So that's a, a big thing that I think people have to understand. I'm going to just hop over to the chat, make sure I'm not missing any questions. Nope, not missing any questions. All right. So now I want to kind of get into like, if you're out there and you're like, okay, is macro tracking for me? Um, as I said, you should already be comfortable keeping a food diary. And let me be honest with you guys. If you guys have goals to lose fat and you are resistant to keeping a food journal, you're missing the number one thing that you need to lose fat. Okay. That's going to simplify everything for you because when you have that, now you have complete control over what you need to tweak. Now, the second component of that is knowing how to optimize the amount of food you're eating to lose fat. Okay. So we don't want to just drop calories drastically because that's going to make it feel really, really difficult. We have to find that cadence. And in my next episode, I'm going to be talking about building out a fat loss plan. And I am going to be talking about this a little bit more in depth. So you need to realize that if you want to see results, you should be tracking your food. If you also are looking to optimize energy and performance and you're tired of like guessing about why some days your workouts go good and why other days they don't, keeping a food diary can help you fix that. If you struggle with inconsistent energy, 
throughout the day or throughout the week. Hormone things going on, sleep issues. Keeping a food diary might help you figure out some changes that you can make to improve those things. So like food diary is where it's at, guys. Okay. But should you count macros? I personally think that when it comes to learning about nutrition, that there is a hierarchy and a process to it, and that macro tracking at some point should come into your life. Why? Because it does so much for building awareness for all those types of things. It's going to come earlier for those of you guys out there that are really motivated, that are like, man, I am ready to dial things in and get results. I really want to make sure I know exactly what's going in and I'm getting the right amount of things and I'm able to get consistent results on the scale every single week. I, I know that a lot of people out there want that. And so in a lot of ways, like those people, they're going to be doing macros earlier on. Others are just getting started and they're like, man, I don't know where to start. I'm eating freaking fast food and, and drinking Mountain Dew. Okay. Just getting them into balancing out their quote unquote macros without counting anything and just keeping a food diary might be step one. Okay. But I think that everybody at, should, at some point should spend a period of time counting macros. Now, if you're trying to get started, here's the easiest way to get started with counting your macros. First of all, you have to be keeping the food diary. Second of all, you need to know where your macronutrient ranges should be. Now, I say macronutrient ranges. Why? Because I think a lot of coaches out there and a lot of people operate on this like macro perfection that they think they have to be spot on their numbers every single day. If their goal is 135 grams of protein, they need to zero that out and be at 135 grams of protein every single day. They think that if their carbs is 205, they have to hit 205 carbs every single day. Guess what? It's not, that's not necessary. Okay. It's not necessary at all. I like my clients to live in ranges and keeping their overall calorie budget in check. Why? Because calories matter most. And our macronutrient ranges will give us enough energy. Your body's not going to feel the difference if you have 135 grams of protein or 130 grams of protein. But if we're consistently eating way less, then we will see a difference there. Okay. So we want to think about when you guys are looking at dialing in your macronutrients, um, you know, you, you have the right set of ranges and that you are keeping a food diary. Okay. So those are the, the two things you need. You're, you're, you have to know your macro ranges. You have to be keeping a food diary. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take a look at how frequently you're eating. You already have that meal structure built in and you're taking a look at the meals that you're eating and, and how those meals are lining up. Really cool feature in my fitness pal, if you do pay for premium, is it does tell you per meal how much protein, carbs, and fat you're getting at every single meal. Little hack is if you don't have pay for premium, if you just turn your phone sideways to where it's like the horizontal way, um, you could also see it there as well without paying for premium. So just a little hack for those of you that don't pay for premium. But now you can take a look at your total macronutrients for the day on one of your recent days, and then look at where your meals are, are kind of falling in place of protein, carbs, and fats. Like, do you need to add protein at breakfast? Do you need to take some fat away from dinner? Now you can manipulate things and, and start to build a plan that works with the foods that you're already eating, swapping out a couple of things here and there. Okay. Um, the other cool thing about this strategy is it does allow for some flexibility out there. You don't have to think about every meal being perfectly balanced. That's the overall goal. But like, let's just say maybe you're going out to dinner and you know that there's a lot more fat in, in foods when you're eating out. You can maybe eat a little bit lower fat earlier in the day to compensate for some of the fat that you might be eating at dinner time. You know, that's just an easier way for you guys to learn how to be flexible with your diet, which is also why I really like macronutrients. It does really help you guys build flexibility into your plan because if you're, you're just really making sure that at the end of the day, you're within your ranges. Okay. So that's really the simplicity of macro tracking. I'm, I'm being, that's how you get started. You literally know your ranges, you keep a food diary, you adjust things. It's really not that difficult. I think where people run into the problem is, is they haven't done the preliminary homework of like ensuring they have a good understanding of where their nu nutrients are coming from. And if you need help with that, just shoot me a message. I do have a couple of guides with like lists of foods, protein, heavy, carb, heavy, fat, heavy combination foods to kind of get my clients to start working with along with a, a pretty good list of like the nutrition facts for a lot of the common foods that don't have labels. Like, you know, like typically like, so people ask questions about, raw versus cooked, which I'm going to get into. 
and they don't know how to, if they're wanting to cook in bulk, like what they should be, what should they be weighing out uh, in terms of cooked protein or cooked rice or whatever it is. I have a pretty good conversion for people to use to kind of make it simpler for them. So if you do want that, just shoot me a message. You can either shoot me an email or shoot me a DM on Instagram or Facebook. Um, or I guess I, I really honestly don't look at the YouTube comments after watching this. So probably we don't put it on YouTube. Just do, do what I said. <laughs> YouTube uh, probably won't work. So do my, my email or my Instagram or my Facebook. Okay. So that's as simple as this get started. Now, a couple of mistakes I think that people make, and I need to make sure that it's, it's really put out there because these are the things that I think matter most is that if you are a macro tracker right now or have been in the past, I think people get hung up on only looking at numbers. And this is a huge flaw with macros because if you're only looking at numbers, you are essentially always going to be reliant on eating by numbers. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat by numbers. You want to learn how to eat intuitively. Um, and, you know, tracking macros is a way to get intentional about eating. But over time, you should be able to look at your plate and be like, that's about 30 grams of protein. I've done this long enough to see that. If you're only ever looking by numbers and playing macro, macro Tetris, like, you are literally essentially committing yourself to tracking macros for the rest of rest of your life. This is also where people get super burned out and they get burned out from it and they want to walk away from it and they never get to their results. They want, they never get the results they want to see. I think the other problem with only focusing on macros is that you don't dial in the nutrients of micronutrients. So like your fiber intake, um, vegetables and such, those are other factors of your nutrition that are going to affect your results. And if we're not dialing those things in, we are often going to see some plateaus. We're also going to see that maybe appetite isn't as regulated. Um, maybe gut health isn't as optimal and other things. So remember that your nutrition is more than just fat loss. Your nutrition is a lot of things. And if you're looking to lose weight, the goal really is fixing your body to allow you to be the lean weight you want to be. It's really not the weight loss process. It's, it's optimizing your body to be leaner than you are right now. And all of these things have to play a factor in that or play a factor in that. I already mentioned the macro perfection, which is one of the mistakes that I wrote down that people make. Um, and I think that this also, to kind of elaborate on this, this is also where people run into this problem of they are tracking really good, like through the week. And then on the weekend when they're like eating out or they're trying to be, you know, out with their friends or they have like a potluck, they like don't track anything because they feel like they can't be perfect. And in reality, at that point, it's just like damage control. You're like, okay, let me just make sure that I'm kind of keeping things within ranges you know, even if you're off hundred calories here or there, like you've at least made it a point to like track and kind of be aware of what's going in. And I think this is also where people uh, have the wrong macros and they're like literally eating in like poverty macros is what I like to call it. Like they're eating on poverty macros. And then when these opportunities come, they feel like it's like the floodgates just open and they like can't control themselves. So having the right numbers often does fix this as well. Another huge problem that I find with people that are tracking macros, especially when they're not seeing results, is they're not tracking everything or they're not tracking things appropriately. Um, well, obviously one big flaw is not using a food scale, but more other flaws are things like they're not tracking oil, butter, creamer in their coffee. I see people that'll log things like chicken cutlet with like breading on it, right? Like that breading, the egg, all that stuff, like that's extra ingredients and that's not gonna be uniform from one recipe to the other. So you have to actually separate those ingredients out, um, which also helps you clean up your diet because that's a lot of work. So you're going to stop getting those extra calories from those types of things, right? So it's also how it kind of segues into, you know, simultaneously making you clean up your food, how you're cooking it and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, oil, butter, creamer, sugar, um, random bites throughout the day. They grab a handful of pretzels. They throw their kids' food away and they have a bite of the macaroni and cheese. All that stuff matters and people don't track it and they, and they don't realize that they're getting in extra calories. Um, nuts are a big one, salad toppings, things that they're putting on their salads, not recognizing it. Um, you know, all that stuff does matter, you know? So we want to make sure we're tracking everything. Uh, I think the third point that I wrote down was overthinking it. Um, they just like are overthinking it all together. Like, you know, they just, they feel like it's too much work. And I think the main reason that they're overthinking it is because they're not taking the time to plan ahead. <laughs> like literally in the moment, they're trying to figure things out. Um, I think that if you 
just relax about being perfect and you just realize like, Hey, make a plan and stick to it. That's really all you have to do, which I think isn't, that's the next one to write down is like not planning ahead. So just like every day in life, you have a, somewhat of a plan of what you're going to be doing. Your nutrition needs to also have a plan, you know, like that's, it's just, that's not obsessive. That's literally just human. That's normal. It's normal to have a plan for your nutrition that aligns with your lifestyle, what, what you're doing that day. So if you're not planning ahead, you're also going to continue to fail. So if you take the time in the beginning to, Hey, like, let me plan out my food and my fitness pal before I eat it. Now I don't have to stress about it tomorrow, you know, or at least doing yourself, uh, at least by logging it before you actually eat it, even if it's just by the meal, you know, like if you're someone like me that already has a pretty good foundation and you build your meals, protein, carbs, and fats, and you have a lot of awareness, you can kind of, you know, obviously be a little bit more flexible with how much you're planning ahead, but you should still be logging ahead or keeping tally on things. Some things you guys can do to simplify, um, simplify it a little bit, especially in the beginning is I like to keep a, a little notepad or something nearby when I am uh, in the kitchen and I'm eating something and I don't have time to track it right away. Or if I'm making a dinner and I have multiple ingredients, I'll just write down those ingredients as I go, knowing that about how much carbs, fats, or proteins are in each of them. So when I go to log it, it's not going to be like, oh my God, I didn't realize how much fat I was eating. You know, so I kind of keep tabs on things and that's an easier way to kind of get you into the habit of tracking um, without feeling like, oh my God, I'm trying to cook dinner and I got my kids screaming at me. Jot it down and then go in and write and log it later. All right. So we're going to go into a few questions that people normally have about tracking macros in general. Um, let me look at these. Here we go. Does the quality of macro source matter questions? Example, protein shake versus steak, meat, protein, animal protein. Okay. So yes, the macro quality does matter. Here's, here's a, this is a great question, Kenneth. Um, all right. So when it comes to quality of macros, yes, it matters. Um, I was actually having a conversation with a new client yesterday about protein. If you eat a plant-based diet or you eat a lot of low quality protein, because plant-based protein is unfortunately a little bit lower, uh, lower quality because of the lower amino acid profile in it, you typically will need more protein. Okay. So, um, your proteins are going to be a little bit higher because the synthesis of that protein is not as good as an animal based or a high quality source. Um, when it comes to your example, Kenneth, of a protein shake versus a steak or meat for protein, whey protein, steak, meat are, I should say, whey protein, steak, chicken, those things are actually all high quality sources if your whey protein is a high quality source of whey protein. Um, however, the digestibility, the thermic effect of feeding of a protein shake versus steak versus chicken breast are all very different. Steak also higher in fat and protein. So it's going to be a little bit higher calories. Um, and then obviously the, the, the protein shake is going to be usually faster assimilated. So it's not going to have nearly as high as a, a thermic effect. So you do digest that much quickly. Um, that's a good question. Same thing with carbohydrates. So if you're eating a lot of simple carbohydrates, white rice, white uh, pastas, white bread, um, sugar, all those things, um, those are going to be a lower quality source. And you're going to, you're not going to be able to eat as much of those foods because your carb, your carb number will be lower because you're absorbing literally all of those carbohydrates versus if you are eating a higher carb diet, or I'm sorry, a higher quality carb diet, that's high in fiber, high in complex carbohydrates. You could usually afford a little bit higher carb number because a lot of your carbs are coming from things like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And so those are going to cause a little bit more of a thermic effect of feeding. And some of those carbohydrates literally don't get absorbed into your bloodstream or into your body at all. They just get passed. So yes, that does matter. Um, carb source, protein source, and fat sources matter as well. Um, good question there. All right, here we go. Was putting together trampoline for the kids, but no worries, Kenneth. I got, I was late to that. So I'm a chronic grazer. Uh, Kenneth mentioned that he's a chronic grazer. Guys, grazing is probably one of the worst habits. I mean, I'm going to be 100% honest. The body is not conditioned to just be taking in calories all day. Why did people start wanting to do intermittent fasting? Because we saw the benefits of going periods of time without eating. Now, you don't have to fast for a period of time like that, but your body should also not be just always digesting food. You need to have a break from that. And when you're at, at night, that's a break. But Throughout the day, if you're just grazing on things, you're likely also over consuming calories. Good questions. 
I'm glad I hopped over there. All right, so going into a couple of things here, a few things that people have questions about. Um, weighing raw versus cooked. This is a big question. Uh, when it comes to weighing raw versus cooked, I always like my clients to just stay consistent with how they're logging it. So if you guys are always weighing your meat raw, then you should always log it raw. If you're always weighing it cooked, you should always log it cooked. Okay. So making sure that the entry that you're using is pretty accurate and the cooking method that you're using is pretty consistent, especially with meats, because what happens when we cook meats is they dehydrate, the water gets pulled from them. Typically, if they're not overcooked, we're looking at about 70 to 75% of retention. So about four ounces of raw protein is going to be about three ounces cooked, but that's not always the case. If you are burning your meat, you're likely going to see it not happen. Sometimes when you cook ground beef, I notice that it does dehydrate a little bit more. Um, so however you're going to be consistent, that's the most important thing. When it comes to things like rice and pasta and potatoes, um, the opposite, well, not really potatoes are similar, but rice and pasta, they do absorb water. Um, so once again, however you're weighing it, you want to stay consistent with that. And then however you're portioning it, you want to stay consistent with that as well. So I personally think that your carb sources, like your rice and your pastas and your potatoes should all be weighed uh, raw because they do change considerably because the amount of water that gets added and absorbed can sometimes change from recipe to recipe. Um, what I typically do is I kind of do a double measure, probably a little bit more work. Um, I weigh raw and then I weigh cooked and that's how I do it. And then what I typically do is I just create a recipe in my fitness pal um, for a single ingredient. I'll put like white rice and in the ingredients, I'll put 280 grams or wait, 45, 90, 270 grams. So if I'm making six servings of rice, 270 grams of, of raw rice. When it gets done cooking, I put the Tupperware on the scale. I put the rice in and it says 1,080 80 grams. And then I'll just put that in the number of servings. So now every time I grab a, a, you know, some rice out, I'll just measure it out in that amount of grams. Like maybe I put 150 on my plate. That's how I'll log it. Maybe I'll put a little tutorial on that for you guys. I don't want to get too in the weeds on that, but just know that However you're weighing it, stay consistent. You don't have to do rocket science. I'm like a freaking mathematician. I feel like it, that's just me. Um, but just be consistent with how you're logging it. Like I said, I have a common foods list that does break down raw versus cooked amounts to make that easier for you guys if you want it. Recipes is another question I get. Um, people, especially as we're going into the winter season, uh, people are going to want to make things like soups and stews and casseroles. Um, creating a recipe in my fitness pal super easy. Essentially what I was just talking to you guys about the white, the, the rice is, is creating a recipe. You're going to do the same thing with a recipe. It's, it's super easy guys. If you want the tutorial on it, shoot me a DM. I have that in my um, meal building, my meal planning stuff. Um, but you can create recipes to make logging those mixed dishes super easy so that you can have family meals with your family and not feel like you have to eat out of your own Tupperware. Um, eating out. I think that this is another question that I already kind of mentioned it. Um, don't get obsessed about being perfect. The easiest things you guys can do is look for a chain restaurant that has a similar entry. If you're at like a, a restaurant that doesn't have any nutrition facts. Um, if you're at a friend's house and it's like home cooked stuff, I like my clients to use like a whole foods or a Trader Joe's or something like that, that sells something like that at the hot case, because they often have the nutrition facts on their website for that stuff. And it makes it super easy. You can even look up frozen entries. So like, let's just say for instance, you're at your friend's and they're making like lasagna. You can look up like a Stouffer's lasagna and estimate the portion. If you're at home, even better because you can weigh it out and you can look at the Stouffer's and it tells you how much weight, even better. Same thing with things like desserts. People bring you cookies or cheesecake or whatever. Don't overthink it. Just find one and, and log it. You can use like a Walmart brand cheesecake or whatever. It just makes sure that you've gotten something accounted for. It's not going to be 100% perfect, but let's just say it fits the bill, right? I'm a chronic chocolate chip cookie eater. Nothing wrong with a good old chocolate chip cookie. If you make them at home, you can create a recipe. I can even show you ways to make them a little healthier if you want me to. Um, I think that people tend to avoid eating the foods that they enjoy when they're in a fat loss phase. And the problem is you're going to have to eat those foods at some point again, or you're going to have to tell yourself never going to eat these again. That's, that's no fun. Um, other questions. I already kind of mentioned logging food you didn't prepare. You're at a friend's house. Um, here's a big one. Taking days off from tracking. Okay. So this is another question I get. Um, when it comes down to taking days off from tracking, it really depends on the individual. 
I think that for a solid four weeks, you should be logging seven days because that allows you to see how changes happen for weekdays to weekends and ensure that you have an accurate account of your calories. Um, and then I think that from there, if you are going to start taking a day or two off, you should be thinking in terms of like not eating by numbers, but like, okay, remembering like, what does my plate typically look like, look like when I'm tracking my food, it should look similar here. And you should be doing the homework on the foods that you're eating when you're not tracking to be able to keep yourself, you know, in check. Um, other times that you might take time off is like when you're going on vacation, I'm totally fine with that. However, expectations should be like, all right, I'm not as dialed in this week. I'm enjoying myself, which is, this is the stuff that I'm going to go into next week. I'm going to talk to you guys about building out a strategy for using, you know, just building out your nutrition strategy to get you leaner, fitter, healthier, and all that kinds of stuff. All right. Last thing that I'm going to put on this is, uh, is it forever? Am I going to be tracking or counting macros forever? This is a huge flaw. I think that people that burn out is because they, they're either committing to something they're not happy with. Like, so for instance, I, I keep a food diary every single day. Are my macros perfect every single day? No, there's weeks where they're not perfect, but you know what? I track my food and I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not always dialed in on my macronutrients though. I do like keeping a food diary. I'll probably over, always do that. It, it's kind of part of my day at this point. It doesn't make me feel restricted. Um, I don't feel guilty about eating foods if I'm going to go over. Um, but when it comes to tracking macros, it's, it's not something that you have to do forever. You should realize, like I said, we should be using it intentionally for a period of time and then being able to move away from it, but also knowing that we can bring it back out if we need to, like if energy starts to crash, maybe weight starts to come back on, we know to pull that back out again and start to really get dialed back in again. So hopefully this episode was helpful for you guys out there. I, I want you guys to realize that like, I don't want people to think that I'm always pushing, like you should be so dialed in with your nutrition, but listen, if you've been out there and you're struggling to like see results and you're tired of guessing about what works and you're doing like stupid protocols that are getting you nowhere, but literally more frustrated with yourself, why not take some time to dial things in the right way and actually know what's going in, understand your nutrition a little bit better and be able to get about your life. That's the goal of it. This is literally the fast track to results. That's really what it is. Macro tracking is the fast track to results. So that's it. Toll House cookies, Jody. we can do that. I think that Toll House cookies are actually not too bad. Let me look up the macros on those. I'm gonna look it up. Toll House chocolate chip cookies. Bear with me if you guys are on a... Do you bake them or do you buy the, the kind that are already made? That's the other question. Shopping. Here we go. I'm gonna pull up the bacon breaks. So those are easy. Toll house cookies. Let's see. Two cookies is four grams of, no, one cookie is four grams of fat, 11 carbs. So you're looking at, for an average serving, I would say it's probably three cookies. So 33 carbs, 12 fat. I mean, really it's gonna take up a big source of your fat. So I would say if you're having three cookies, you should probably be having it with a lower fat meal. Uh, the carb wise, it's only 33 grams of carbs though. Zero fiber. So that's one of those things that like, Hey, we wouldn't want to be eating this at every single meal, but if I've had a high fiber day and I've, I've really, you know, prioritized making sure that every other meal is on point, I think those can totally fit in. The more I take about it, the more I work on my routines, this topic is appreciated. Oh, of course, of course. I think that, um, Okay. Yeah. I think of course, the more we talk about it, the more you're going to buy into it too, Jody. I, I did send you a pretty in-depth uh, message yesterday. So hopefully that was helpful for you. Uh, and I do want you to reach out to me so we can set up some time to chat because I definitely want to help you out. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to get ready for my workout. I think I'm going to do some toast to bar dumbbell bench. I'm feeling a little abs and guns today. That's what I'm feeling. And uh, then I'll probably zone to it. That's my usually Tuesday. My Tuesday's my zone two day. So I'll do some zone two and listen to whatever, whatever Scott's got on his podcast this week. And uh, that's what I got. So, all right. So next week's topic, guys, I'm going to be helping you guys build out a nutrition strategy. I'm going to be talking a little bit about periodization, um, really how to streamline things that when you're in your fat loss phase, like you're focused, you're going. And then you know how to get out of that fat loss phase. And uh, if you guys are looking to really dial in your nutrition, you want some help, uh, shoot me a message, shoot me a DM, 
shoot me an email, share at myfitbodyrx. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, until the next episode, guys, talk to y'all soon.